Holy, holy, holy. Well, this time, children in preschool through kindergarten are dismissed for Children's Church. And as they're going, I invite you to, once again, turn in your Bibles to Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. And as we are turning there, and as we are preparing our hearts for receiving the word this morning, let us do so in a spirit of prayer. Father, we sing those words. Father, we are reminded of your mercy and your might, God in three persons, merciful and mighty. And Father, we need both. Father, we need your mercy, we need your might, we need your love, we need your power, we need your strength. And Father, we ask that in these moments as we come to your word, Father, we do so recognizing that apart from your spirit, these are just words on a page. But Father, in the movement of your spirit, in the power of your spirit, they are life-giving words. Father, they are active. And Father, we pray that they would be active in our midst, among us and within each one of us. Father, orchestrate that to your glory and to your praise. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I had to chuckle. After speaking in the chapel service at Asbury College, which uh, ignited the outpouring of God's Spirit on that campus over the last couple of weeks, the speaker, Zach Meerkrebs, and I was interested to discover that he attended Indiana Wesleyan University, while our son Brad was at Indiana Wesleyan University. They were friends, 
and uh, both involved in, Brad didn't play soccer, he was the voice of the soccer team, the announcer at soccer games, and his roommate's uh, friends, friendship circle were a lot of the soccer players there. And so he knew Zach. And I, I found it interesting that as, as Zach Mercreebs walked off the platform after that chapel service, he immediately took out his phone, he texted his wife these words. Latest stinker. I'll be home soon. <laughs> he felt like he'd laid an egg in that chapel service. I've been there. Well, it's amazing what God can do uh, through his people. Well, that's one memorable phrase that came out of that experience. And the other one that caught my attention was this. Holiness unto the Lord. If you saw the, the chapel, the Hughes Memorial Chapel there on Asbury College campus, you, you saw those words. They were emblazoned above the, the big pipes of the pipe organ. Holiness unto the Lord. Well, having seen those words on multiple occasions, I, I thought about that phrase and, and pondered its meaning. What does that communicate? Well, well, at the root, as we've noted often, the root of the word group that contains both holy and holiness is the idea of other or different or set apart. And, and even now, at this moment, in the glories of heaven, as the seraphim surround the throne of God, they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The, this angelic choir is recognizing and celebrating the otherness, the difference, the uniqueness, the one-of-a-kindness, the set-apartness of God from all other beings. That being the case, Holiness unto the Lord is a word of commitment, of consecration, which challenges every follower of Christ to be set apart by and to and for the Lord. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to be different from non-believers in our relationship with God, in our worship of God, in our trust in God, in our love for God, and in our service to God. Holiness, set apart, separateness unto the Lord. All, all of this has challenged me to consider, is my set apartness to God evident to him? And is it evident to others with whom I interact? Would it be a given if someone were to examine my life, that, that would it be a given that I'm in relationship with the holy God? That I am a worshiper of God? That I am fully trusting in God? That I have a vibrant love for God? That I am faithful in service to God? In short, could it be said of me, and could it be said for everyone here who claims the name of Jesus, that our lives bear the evidence of holiness unto the Lord, that we are set apart for him. That was the Apostle Paul's desire for himself, and that was the Apostle Paul's desire for his fellow believers in the church at Corinth. His desire was that all would recognize that they are set apart by the Lord through faith in Jesus Christ, and that they are set apart for the Lord. It, it seems that at least for some within the church at Corinth, their holiness, their set apartness, was not always obvious to others. And Paul desires better things for some of them. Which leads us here, our goal, or at least one of our goals, as followers of Jesus Christ, should be to live as those who have been set apart by the Lord, to the Lord, and for the Lord. 
And to do so, in terms of our series here through 2 Corinthians, that, that our set-apartness, that the difference in our lives would be evident to all, even if the road that we're traveling down is not an easy road, but perhaps a hard road. You see, maybe it's easy to live separate to the Lord on the easy road. But maybe a little more difficult when the hard road is underneath our feet. Well, in Paul's words to the Corinthians, I want you to notice with me three things which he believed would nurture holiness in his life, which would nurture holiness in the life of the church at Corinth, and would nurture holiness in the lives of all his readers throughout all the generations. So let's take a look at those three things this morning. The, the first thing that we notice from his words is, is this, that our holiness, our set-apartness, is nurtured by the company we keep. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Now, most Bible commentators see here a reference to God's command in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. And there we read, do not plow with an ox and donkey yoked together. All right, I won't do that, I promise. I'm not going to hitch my ox to my donkey and try to plow a field. Now, I read that and I think, all right, what's, why? Why was this important for God to say? What is he communicating? Is there a principle here that I need to not miss? Well, through the years, two conclusions have been drawn as to why God gave this instruction to the Israelites. Uh, one just simply goes to ineffectiveness and inefficiency. Ox, as I'm told, are stronger than donkeys. And if you yoke them together, if you hitch them together, the ox is always going to pull the donkey along, and the donkey, being stubborn, will be resisting that. And so there will not be effectiveness, there will not be efficiency, but there will be resistance as they try to get anything accomplished. And so it's not a good mix. The second thing that has been suggested is that an oxen and donkeys, they are not the same. And to yoke two different animals together fails to recognize the differences that were ordained by God in creation. To appreciate and affirm the differences inherent in each one. They are not the same. Now let me be clear. As Paul says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Nowhere does scripture call us to be totally disassociated from all interactions with non Christians. Scripture doesn't teach that, and Paul isn't speaking that. How can we impact people with the good news of Jesus Christ if we never rub shoulders with those very people who near, need to hear the gospel? No, no, what Paul is encouraging is allowing the people who most exert influence in our lives to be those who, like us, are new creations in Christ, People for whom the old has gone and the new has come. People who, like us in Christ, have been reconciled to God and whose priorities and values and longings and lifestyles and counsel are shaped by and in step with Jesus himself. As Paul previously warned his readers in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, don't be misled. It's interesting if you turn to that passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, in your scripture, you'll find bad company corrupts good character. And it's in quotations. Paul is quoting one of the poets of the Corinthian pagans. He's saying, everybody understands this. This is obvious, even to your pagan poets. Bad company corrupts good character. 
As if Paul is concerned that some in Corinth will still be slow to get it, or not convinced that Paul knows what he's talking about, Paul offers a series of rhetorical questions meant to help them see the light, to drive home his point. He says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Nothing. Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Well, well, none. They can't coexist. Either the light penetrates the darkness, or the darkness is so deep that it overwhelms and consumes the light. What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, between Christ and Satan? What harmony, what, what point of commonality can they reach? Where can they walk together? Where can Jesus, where can Christ and Satan walk together in harmony and unity? They can't. Satan is opposed. He will resist the very Son of God at every step. There's no common ground. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? The believer's life is... Or, Centered on Christ. The non-believer's life is centered on self. The treasure of the non-believer is treasure found here on earth. The treasure of the Christian is kept in heaven. The values of the non-believer are the values of this world. The values of the believer are those found in the world to come. The believer seeks the glory of God. The unbeliever, the glory of man. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Nothing. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? How can you worship in the temple of God and then go to a pagan place of worship. You might, but you shouldn't. You can't truly worship both God and mammon. God dwells in the midst of his people and within his child. So too are the worshipers of God and the followers of Satan poles apart. Out of curiosity the other day, I, I began making a list of every automobile that I have owned in my life. I came up with 15. Now, Ron may want to check me on that. I'm not sure I, I got everyone. But, but I can think of 15 cars that I have owned in the course of my lifetime. The first, and dare I say the best, <laughs> oh, it has a place in my heart. It was a 1973 Chevy Impala. It was as long as this aisle. <laughs> it was lime green with a white rag top. Yeah? It had a gas-guzzling V8 engine. And the trunk leaked. Couldn't put anything in the trunk because it would always get wet. But I love that car. Well, some of the vehicles, some of those 15 vehicles, they served Ron and I well. Others simply served their purpose as mere transportation. And the couple served as constant sources of grief. I, I was thinking about the worst vehicle I ever owned. I don't know if I should say this out loud or not, but I will. It was a Plymouth Voyager minivan. We drove it with great pride off the lot. We drove it home. We parked it in the garage. And within hours, we noticed engine coolant dripping on the floor of the garage. So we make a call, we take it back. Oh, you need a head gasket replaced. Oh. So they did it. They didn't charge us. That was great. But then after that, every 18 months, we had to replace the head gasket in that minivan. Until finally, we needed to replace the whole head because it had become warped. Well, I talked to my uncle about this situation. 
he was a mechanic. He knew what he was talking about. So I said, you know, what's the, what's the story with this? And he said, well, the engine block in that type of engine is cast iron. The head of the engine is aluminum. And those metals respond differently to the heat produced by the combustion engine. And the aluminum cannot, does not have the same tolerance of heat as the cast iron. And so those two metals should never have been put together in an engine. They just don't work together. It's a bad combination. The same thing is true of, of Christians and non-Christians. We're not made to be yoked in, in the most intimate of relationships, the closest of relationships together. Now, not everyone in the church of Corinth was convinced of that. Perhaps not everyone here is convinced of that. But, but take stock sometime about the people that speak into your life. The people that influence your life, your friends, the musical artists, the musicians that sing into your life, the actors, the images on the computer that speak into your life. Is the company you're keeping moving you toward holiness or away from it? Now, you can argue all you want with God or Paul, but the reality is the company we keep matters. And the company we keep influences us. And so for the sake of holiness, for the sake of the worship of God, for the sake of our trust in God, for the sake of our love for God, for the sake of our service to God, keep closest to God's people. Keep closest to those who are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Keep closest to the people of God and the followers of Christ. That their presence, their love, their words, their testimony, their faith will lead you ever closer in an increasing measurement to holiness unto the Lord. Holiness within us is nurtured by the company we keep. But also, Paul tells us, by the promises of God. It's as if Paul, knowing that many in the church at Corinth do not respect him nor his words, nor will they hear his words, nor respond to his words, as words spoken by an apostle of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul was an apostle by the will of God. As an apostle, he had the right, the calling, the commandment to speak on behalf of Christ, in the authority of Christ, as a representative of Christ. But there were some in the church at Corinth who would not acknowledge his authority, who would not listen to what he had to say. And so he says, okay, you won't listen to me. Will you listen to the word of the living and holy God? Does that matter to you? Is that powerful enough? Will that get your attention? So he quotes the scriptures to move them towards an ever deepening relationship with God, to encourage them towards an ever deepening worship of God, to an ever deepening trust in God, to an ever increasing love for God, to an ever increasing service to God. In short, to move them to greater holiness unto the Lord. He said, Here's what the Word of God says. His second appeal is to the eternal truths and the promises of the living and holy God. He appeals to those who are temples of the living God, who dwell in the presence of God and are indwelt by the person of God. Paul assumes that though they may easily write him off, they will be less quickly ready to write off the scriptures. And so he writes... As God has said, as God has said, these are the words of the holy God, the living God, the one true God. As God has said, assuming that what God has to say is of value to them, 
What, what follows is a, is a scripture salad of God's promises drawn from the words of Moses and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah and David. He said, you won't listen to me. How about these? These prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. The blessings of God will be poured out. They will be lavished upon those who are in relationship with God, those who worship him, trust him, love him, and serve him. There'll be closeness. There'll be intimacy of relationship. There'll be fellowship. I will live with them, and I will be their God. And they'll be my people. Therefore, since you have received and are re experiencing the richness of God's blessing, in response, therefore, come out from them and be separate. Be holy, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Did you notice that? As God says, says the Lord, says the Lord Almighty. The promises of God to those who are in Christ should nurture within the Christian gratitude for the blessings which are ours in Christ and a longing for closer relationship with God and not merely an arm's length relationship with him. Our holiness is nurtured by the promises of God, what God has said to us, what God has done for us. It should make a difference in how we live our life on this world. The psalmist says, blessed is the man or the woman who walks in the counsel, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of mockers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And they are transformed and they are shaped by the promises of God. The, the, the Christian's holiness our relationship with God, our worship of God, our trust in God, our love for God, our service to God are nurtured and fueled by the promises of God's word. Hard is the heart that being reminded of that which God has done for us in Christ, hard is the heart that is not moved towards greater holiness, towards greater separation unto the Lord. Hard is the heart who celebrates what God has done but refuses to listen to what God has said. Our holiness is nurtured by the promises of God. But thirdly, Paul tells us that our holiness is nurtured by the choices we make. Alan Redpath, he was the pastor of Moody Memorial Church up in Chicago. Between 1955 in 1962, a seven-year span, he was the pastor there. Somewhere within those seven years, he preached a series of messages from the book of 2 Corinthians. And the series in the book was titled, or the sermons were put into a book. And, and the, the, the book was titled, the series, sermon, the series of sermons was titled, Blessings Out of Buffeting. And the sermon title for this passage that we're looking at this morning was A Call to Consecration. Now, I found his introductory paragraph of interest. This was back in the late 50s, early 60s, when he wrote this. And he wrote this. This is how he began. I am sure that a minister never appears in so forbidding a form, especially to young people, as he does when he comes to deal with a subject of separation and the relationship of the Christian to the world in which we live. Many people are almost ready to account him an enemy of their happiness and call him a kind of promoter of gloom and misery. That was 1955. 
He says, boy, you know, it's hard as a pastor to talk about holiness because people are going to roll their eyes and not want to hear what has to be said. But what I find interesting is I think Paul felt that same tension. I think he realized there are people in Corinth that are going to be rolling their eyes. Boy, Paul the killjoy. Notice what he says. Paul evidently felt that tension. He, he continues. Since we have these promises, since the Lord Almighty has spoken, since God has spoken, since we have these promises, and we are new creations in Christ Jesus, and we've been reconciled through Christ, to Christ, through Christ, to God, since we have these promises, and they are not for us just simply idle words, but they are words of life. Since we have these promises, and that's what he says. Dear friends. Dear friends, we have these promises. Now, I, I was, uh, didn't know this, hadn't never really noticed it in all the studies of, I've done through Paul's letters. But, but it was drawn to my attention by one Bible commentator that this word, Dear friends, in, in some translations, comes across as beloved. Paul uses that word only seven times in all of his writings. He wasn't casting around the terms, terms of endearment. He, he speaks it once in his letters to Rome, to the Roman church. He speaks it twice the church of Philippi, and we know we have a special relationship and kinship with them. The other four uses, the four other times he speaks to his beloved is the church at Corinth. To those who question him. To those who were dismayed by him. To those who rolled their eyes See, Paul isn't saying these things to beat them down. He's saying these things because they are important and he loves them. And they need to hear them. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. Perfecting holiness. And by that he means by making continuing progress in holiness. He said, let's do so out of reverence for God. Because of what God in Christ has done for us. Let us continually move towards increasing worship of, trust in, love for, service to our God. Know specifically what he asks of them. He says, and notice this, let us, let us. Paul, Paul stands shoulder to shoulder with the, his fellow believers there in Corinth. I mean, he joins the circle. He's not outside the circle, he's in the circle. He says, let us. He doesn't say, you must. He says, let us. He understands this is for Paul as well. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. Everything that would contaminate. That, that, that word purify, it, it means to make a complete break. Make a thorough cleansing from every unhealthy compromise with sin and evil. Paul says let's do that together. Now, in the old days, I used to, and I, I just used to hear it. I didn't have much experience in this. But in the old days, I used to hear talk of doing spring cleaning. Hmm? And now, more recently, we don't hear so much about spring cleaning, but we hear what? About deep cleaning. You know, I, I, again, I don't speak from experience. 
But, but when I hear that, I, I, I hear, you know, we're not just going to touch the surface of stuff and say, that's okay. No, we're, we're going to get into every dark corner of our house, every crease and every crevice, and in the basement, and in the, we are going to really get after this dirt. Because we don't want to live in filth. And we're not just going to do it surface level. We're going deep. Well, it takes effort to do that. And that's what Paul is calling himself to, and the Christians in Corinth to, and us to, to a deep cleaning. He's calling us to make war against sin in the inner recesses of body and spirit. That there are choices we can make that will lead us to greater holiness or to lesser holiness. There are choices that we can make to closer orbit around God or greater distance from God. The question is, do we care enough? Does it matter enough to us to make hard choices, to say no to something that does not bring us closer to Jesus? Are we willing to say no to things that do not cause the image and the likeness of Jesus to become more evident in us? I'm going to add another scripture to the scripture salad that Paul uses here. Psalm 139. David, the man after God's own heart. David, the man that God looked into and said, into his heart and said, I like what I see. In that young man. But yet David, who wasn't in by any means perfect. But he, he prayed, God, I want you to do deep cleaning in here. He said, I, I'm not satisfied with surface holiness. I, I want you to really get in there. I really want you to show me what needs to go. Because I don't want to be far from you. I want to be close to you. And so he prayed, search me, O God. And know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Father, see if there's anything, any offensive way in me. Because I don't want it there. I want to be rid of it. I want to be cleansed from it. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Holiness under the Lord is fueled by the choices we make. By what we choose to tolerate or not tolerate in our lives. Oh, may we choose wisely. May we always choose holiness unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. May we leave no doubt in anyone's mind that we are set apart for the Lord. That that, that holiness may may be apparent to all that holiness is what we long for. May it be apparent that our relationship with God, our worship of God, our trust in God, our love for God, our service to God are the most important things about us. The most important things to us. If these things are important to us, we'll demonstrate it by paying attention to who it is that's influencing us. By paying attention to the promises of God's word. And by by making choices which draw us closer in rather than farther from our Heavenly Father and our Savior, Jesus. Holiness unto them. We have a longing for holiness, for close orbit around our Creator God, our Heavenly Father, who is so through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, holiness unto you. Father, may we not be, become satisfied with separation from you, or distance from you. But Father, may our hearts long for and beat for closeness 
and intimacy and relationship with you. Father, do a work in our hearts through the work of your Holy Spirit. Father, that our worship of you will be ever more vibrant. Father, we pray that our trust in you would be ever deeper and fuller. Father, that our love for you would be widening and deep. Father, that our service to you would flow out of love for that which in Christ you have done for us. Father, may each one of us long for holiness unto you because we belong to you. And Father, we desire to serve you. Father, grant this, we pray, by your spirit and for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a song in our hymnal that says, Take Time to Be Holy is the title. And I, I was thinking about that song. And, and you know, we sing it, Take Time to Be Holy. That's like we're singing it to each other. You know, you need to be holy. You, take, you, 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 take time to be holy. And I wasn't really satisfied. I really wasn't comfortable with that. I don't want someone, I don't want to be telling other people what you should do. So in my mind, I, I, I envision this, that I'm having a conversation, I'm set across the table with the songwriter. And the songwriter is looking me in the eyes, and, and he's saying, Neil, take time to be holy. Neil, speak oft with your Lord. Neil, Abide in him always. And Neil, feed on his word. Neil, make friends with God's children. Help those who are weak. Neil, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. Oh, as we sing these words as we close this morning. May we hear the songwriter. May we hear our Savior saying to us, Neil, insert your own name. Take time to be holy, that you may be holy unto the Lord. Would you stand as we sing together?
Father, we pray that your spirit would place within us a hunger for holiness. Father, that our lives may demonstrate the difference that you make in our lives. Father, we pray this not for our own glory, but for your glory, for your honor, for your praise. Father, equip us to that end, we pray in the strong and the powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. You are dismissed. Go in peace.